so the thought is this it's a pretty rainy day outside and while it's kind of clear right now it's gonna rain again so I decided that Penny and I would go make some coffee and answer some of your questions about film photography <laughs> top of that and motorbike broke down. So we're gonna go find a spot more out of the wind and maybe let this thing cool down. We'll figure that out later. Wow. Out of the mud hole. Come on. Alright, so our kit is a little different today. We've got the freeling, backpacking stove, the kettle, and a grinder and a film camera. What's the point of all this? Um, to me, the point of this and like the point of most other things is just to do something, to try something, to create, to mess up, to see what you like, to see what you don't like. You just never know where something might go. So instead of staying inside on a rainy day and messing around on the computer, we'll come out here make some coffee. We've got some water here. Make sure you're using those reusable bottles, folks. Also, it's super wet out here. We're on pine needles, but they're damp. A little bit more water. Drink. That's good, huh? That's good. You want some more? Good girl. Have a little more. So, why film? Why not? I mean, it's pretty fun. It's, uh, there's something to it, I think. I don't think it's necessarily one of those things for me that makes me think, oh, it slows me down. You know, I think about every frame. It doesn't really slow me down. And a lot of the times if something cool is happening, I'm just gonna shoot, shoot, shoot as much as I would with any other camera. So that may be the case for some people, but for me, not so much. This is the setup right here. I'm gonna check our water. We're going for about 205. Shut that off. And we wait until we're at four and a half minutes or sometimes nine minutes because I forget. I wrote down all of your questions. I asked on Instagram and Twitter, just what do you want to know about film photography? What's scary? What are you worried about? What is the thing that could be keeping you from starting? There goes a chipmunk, or here comes a chipmunk. Wow, anyway, what is the resistance for you? There's all of the unknowns and what should I be worried about? What should I not be worried about? Excellent. So since I'm experiencing all of this resistance when starting something new, I remembered what it was like to start shooting film. And so the point of this whole thing is to answer your guys' questions, to answer your fears, your doubts, your unknowns, all of that stuff, and just take away any resistance that I can to help you get started shooting film. Perfect. Perfect, it's just a cup of coffee. It's, it's good though. Cheers. Whew, she's hot. Good thing to do any time that you're out and about is get your stuff ready to go. So it could start raining at any time and that's fine, but you don't want to be sitting here like a like a dingus with all of your stuff lying out. Like get it ready to go at least, except for the stuff you're actually using. I've got your questions right here and let's just go over some. So how do we shoot film? Don from Lancaster asks, do I process my own film? Don, no, I do not. I don't really have any interest in doing that. I'm sure it would be cool, and I'm sure if I were around it at all, I would instantly change my mind. But so far, my time is probably better spent out doing things and creating things and just letting a professional do their job. I think it's a really cool thing for people to do, but personally, 
I'm just not there. I like to shoot the photos and I have a hard enough time getting myself to the post office just to mail them out. So I don't want any more resistance there. This next great question comes in from Stacy in the Cayman Islands. Hi, Stacy. What kind of film do I shoot? So far, I just shoot color negative film, which is like your portraits, your Fuji 400H, Color Plus, Kodak Gold, all that stuff. And my go-to films are Portra 400 for 35 millimeter and Portra 800 on 120. Next question. Oh, we've got another Don here. Let's see, Don from Fresno says, what is box speed? What do you set your camera at? So, also there's, I didn't write down anyone's names. That's just a joke. Um, Don from Fresno asks about box speed. So box speed is what the film is labeled at. Portra 400 has a box speed of 400. Portra 800, the box speed is 800. And how I use that with color negative film, I set my camera for a stop overexposed. If my camera is DX coded, which means I put the film in and the camera automatically says, this is a 400 speed film. In that case, I set my exposure compensation to plus one stop. If I've got an older camera like this guy that has little dials that you actually set the ASA or the ISO, the film speed on, if it's 400, I'll set that to 200. And at that point, I don't tell the lab anything differently. I don't do anything differently. I just build in that additional stop of overexposure. Metering for film. I forget who asked. I think like 10 people asked. Camera meters are just trying to get something to gray, which means if a camera sees all white, it thinks it's too bright. I need to make it darker. If it sees something that's all black, it thinks it's too dark. I need to make it brighter. So while camera meters are great for averaging the light and all of that, you need to understand what they're doing. So for instance, if I show you this very light piece of paper and put the camera in an automatic mode, the camera is gonna start darkening down the exposure trying to make this gray. Also, if I put this black rain jacket in front of the camera, then the camera is gonna think too dark, oh crap, and try to raise everything up. So that's what your meter is trying to do. That being said, how do we meter? So. For digital, as you can see up here, these highlights are just kind of blown out. And once highlights get blown out in digital, they're just gone. The rule kind of is, if you're shooting in digital, you're gonna expose for the highlights, just making sure you don't blow those highlights out. And then later you'll bring the shadows up. Film is the exact opposite. With film, if your shadows are dark, they're not really gonna get brighter. On the other hand though, if you expose for the shadows, your highlights are not gonna blow out in the same unattractive way that they will on digital. You can definitely go too far, but basically the rule is on film, expose for the shadows, and on digital, expose for the highlights. And so how do we do that is another thing. Think about it this way. Um, here it is, this is not as difficult as it sounds. Here's a drawing. These are mountains, so everything down here is the ground. Everything up here is the sky. If you point your viewfinder up in the sky, you're metering for the highlights, and that's gonna give you a darker exposure. So with digital, that can be a good thing because you have your highlights, you can bring back the shadows in post. If you point your camera in the middle, you're gonna get, depending on what kind of metering system your camera uses, mixed results. If you point your viewfinder down at the ground, that's metering for the shadows because this is the darker part. And so if you're metering for the shadows with digital, you're gonna blow out your highlights and they're gonna be white and gone. They're gonna be worse than the ones in the back of this video. With film though, I would point my camera down here at the ground, exclude the sky, and that way I'm metering for those shadows. Then I'll recompose however I want and shoot it that way. So it's really simple, but I think it's something that can seem a little overwhelming or intimidating or technical. And it's really just, where are you pointing the camera? At the sky, at the ground, in between? And how do you meter from that? Editing film, yes. You can edit film, you can change a lot of stuff about it. You just can't jerk around the shadows and the highlights in the way that you can on digital. So finding a lab that will listen to you is super important because basically unedited film is just film that has not been scanned. So when film is scanned, it's being digitized and that scanner has profiles built into it that have different color levels. And so even the base color level is something that was programmed by someone. So to me, when it comes to digital scans, there's no such thing as an unedited film photograph because that scanner does have inputs on colors, contrast, exposure, and everything. 
everything else. I don't edit my film a lot. I get really good colors from State Film Lab. They've been my lab for the last couple of years and anytime that I've had feedback about colors or contrast or things like that, they've just been super responsive and always made sure that I was happy with how my colors looked, what my contrast looked like, and I couldn't be happier. So. All that being said, it is so important to find a good lab that you feel like you can communicate with and ultimately, even more importantly, to find someone that is going to listen to you and what you want and need. So the biggest part of my editing is the communication that I have with State Film Lab and most of the time when I get scans back, I don't do anything to them. I might straighten them out, but that's it. Getting good colors with film. I'm just gonna talk about color negative film today because that's what I have experience with and that's probably what most of you will be shooting with. If you overexpose a shot with digital, a lot of the time your info is just gone. And with film, as you overexpose, you get better colors and better contrast. Within reason, you can go too far and you still wanna be sure you're metering accurately, but getting good colors to me is all about shooting in good light and giving that film just a little bit extra light. Trusting focus. This is a big one. It depends on the camera. If you're shooting one of these, which is a through the lens manual focus camera, when you look through the viewfinder, you're actually seeing what the lens is seeing. And so it is very easy to tell if you are in focus or not. If you're shooting with a range finder, those can go out of calibration. So it could be the case that you're focusing correctly, but the range finder is not calibrated or needs to be calibrated. And so you can miss focus. This is why it's really important with every new camera and film just to shoot some test rolls. Autofocus depends on the camera, depends on the lighting, just like the camera I'm filming on. If you're shooting backlit stuff, you're gonna miss focus a lot in autofocus with any camera. If you're shooting really fast moving subjects or shooting in really low light, you're gonna miss focus a lot, just like with most cameras. So with autofocus, it's all about shooting with that camera to find out when it's gonna nail focus, when it's gonna struggle, and understanding those limitations. Here's a good one. Will I shoot multiple frames of something that is really important? Absolutely. And to me, a good picture is just so valuable. So if everything's happening and it's perfect and great or close to it right now, then it's just so much easier to buy an extra roll of film or pay for an extra roll of film to be processed than it is to recreate whatever's happening in front of you. Light meters. Do I use a light meter? You can use an app on your phone and I think the most accurate way to go is to get an external light meter but I don't do that. I shoot generally with cameras that have an internal light meter. And sometimes those cameras light meters are off a half stop compared to my tastes. So with a new camera, I shoot test rolls in a lot of different circumstances just to understand what that meter is doing and how it's working, if it's accurate. So if the camera is underexposing by a half stop, I'll just add in that additional half stop of exposure compensation going forward. Storing film, long-term freezer, think months. Short term, a couple of weeks, store it in the fridge. And when you're getting ready to shoot it, pull it out of the fridge a few hours before you load it in the camera so it's not as brittle. I've never really had a problem though, even if I forgot and pulled it right out of the fridge and loaded it and shot it and whatever. After that, the film goes back in the fridge until it goes in the mail. So freezer long term, fridge short term, shoot it and then put it back in the fridge until you send it off. What camera do I start out with and what film do I start out with? I suggest a Canon AE-1 program or a Canon AE-1 or a Canon A1 or anything that looks like this is gonna be great. It's gonna have manual controls which will teach you basically how the light meter is working and they're pretty inexpensive, they're pretty cool looking and they're just fun to shoot with. And I don't recommend point and shoots first because there are a lot of variances and price ranges in those cameras. And so it's really easy to buy some cheaper ones, one, two, three, or four of them and find out that they're all broken in some way or another. So I generally suggest starting out with an SLR like this. It has a light meter in it. You can set the film speed manually and it's just really fun to shoot with. For film, I would say go cheap. My favorite cheap film, which is also just one of my favorite films overall, is Kodak Color Plus 200. It is a color negative film. It is inexpensive. The colors are awesome. I can't recommend that enough. Kodak Gold, Kodak Color Plus 200, they're, I think they're basically the same thing. On the other hand, you have like the Fuji Superior. All of that stuff is wonderful. I've shot all of it. 
had awesome results, loved it. And so my thought is that since we're lucky enough to have such good cheap options these days, just go cheap and shoot a lot of the same type of film so you can understand that film stock and then have a definitive answer for why you need to switch film stocks because it's all gonna behave differently in cloudy conditions, sunny conditions. So my thought is just pick one and shoot it a bunch. Someone else whose name I forgot to write down says, is the Olympus XA the best pocket camera? Possibly. I don't like it that much just because I can't seem to get my eye into the viewfinder, but my buddy Matt Day does, and he's a much better photographer than I am. Olympus XA might possibly be the best pocket camera. Okay, here's a good one. What is the biggest obstacle in getting started? So that's what I'm going through right now with these videos, and that is just the unknowns. All of the question marks involved are basically resistance. Those things team up to keep you from diving in, from trying stuff. They keep us scared, and I think the fear of failure and these unknowns and not having instant feedback is another thing as well. What I found out so far doing videos like this and what I found out when I was doing photography with a digital camera or a film camera is that the more I did it, the less scary it got, even though I might have messed up more than I thought I would have. Remember that you can go into this thing head first and completely screw up in every single way and it's still not gonna be as bad as you think it is. What camera do I buy? What film stock do I shoot? What does box speed mean? Where do I send the film? Do I have to develop it myself? How do I get my photos back? And so once you realize that, oh, I can spend 80 bucks, get a camera that works great, spend $4, get a roll of film that is gonna look awesome, send it to a lab and get it back digitized as a scan, it's not that hard. It's just when all of those things are unknown, that's when it seems scary. Also, I think I'm about to get rained on. Uh, Penny dog, come here. Bring me your pine cone. Get your pine cone. Get it. Oh, good girl. What do we have next here? Yeah, it's starting to rain. Wind film, wind digital. Honestly, for me, if I'm shooting photos of my life, I'm not being paid for these photos. I'm at a swimming hole with Claire. I shoot all film because I find that when I shoot film, I don't worry about editing those photos later. I get them back and they look awesome. And these are the photos that we sit down together and look at them, not just when they first come back, but months later. I mean, I look through my film photos all the time. So if it's just life stuff, I shoot film. And I will shoot digital when it's super low light or things like that, or like astrophotography. But that's the general answer. Everyday life kind of stuff, uh, going on a trip with Claire or a vacation, film. If it's commercial work, I'm usually shooting digital just to make the client happy with a fast turnaround time. I know that I can generally accomplish the same thing with either format, but it's all about making whoever's in charge happy. And so when I'm working for someone, they're in charge. When I'm shooting for myself, I'm in charge. Here's another good one on the same note. Why film when an iPhone is just as good? That's a good one. iPhones are awesome. iPhones are so good. To me, I can't make my photos from an iPhone or a DSLR or mirrorless camera look quite the same way that I can get them to with film, and that's just a personal preference. So the iPhone is probably one of the digital cameras that I shoot with the most. To me, they're supplemental, and one doesn't eclipse the other. So, you know, if something happens, I know that I always have my iPhone on me and I can pull my camera out, take a really good photo and go on about my business. Hey, good girl. At that point, it's really just about what feels good, what's fun, what works for you. And I wrote something down here and that's kind of my segue into why I shoot film. And the thing everyone talks about is that, oh, it makes you slow down and blah, blah. It, I mean, that might be true for some people, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. For me, it's about accomplishing something that I can't do in the same way on digital, so I don't really slow down when I shoot film. I'm in the moment. I shoot aperture priority in film, whereas I don't on digital, so I'm actually probably shooting faster with film. I know that it's okay if the highlights are really bright, because they're gonna look great. They're not gonna just turn to weird, clipped out gray-white. I think for me, it allows me to get out of cameraman mode and just experience life and be able to shoot life without turning into forest on the job. And that's such a big part of it for me is that I can capture life without going into the photographer mode and going from experiencing and living something to documenting it. 
formats of films. So there's a lot of different formats of film, but we have several that are the most popular. And 35 millimeter, which is what most film cameras are, what this one here is, that's the most popular. Um, you usually get 24 or 36 shots a roll. And by the way, it costs the same amount of money to have a roll of 24 photos developed and scanned as it does for a roll of 36. So always buy the 36. But yeah, so you have 35, it's relatively inexpensive, fast, cheap, a lot of camera options. The next size up is medium format. You get a bump up in image quality, but you have more limited options, it's slower. And so this includes a lot of different aspect ratios like 645, 66, 67, 6x9. The film is more expensive because you're getting fewer shots per roll. And when you hear people talking about 120 film, that's medium format. It goes bigger from there to 4x5 and 8x10, but those are like big old box cameras that are super awesome, but really clunky, expensive, and not something that I'm qualified to talk about. How do you manage prices of film now? Since I shoot professionally, film is just a part of my cost of doing business. I can write it off, I shoot a lot of it, it's valuable to me. And if I weren't doing this professionally, I would just stick to Kodak Color Plus 200 or Kodak Gold. I would suggest finding a camera like I recommended, you're gonna spend under $100 most likely and you'll have something that's gonna work for generations. How do I change the look of my film or how do I manage what that film looks like? There are two things, what's happening at the point of capture and what's happening in the lab. Some of it could be just the light you're shooting in and you just need to find better light or more light or less light or something. And another thing would be what's happening when that film is being scanned. So the best thing is just to ask your lab. They do this every day. They see thousands of scans, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they can tell you exactly what you need to do. The dog is still losing its mind over there, but really quickly, this video is sponsored by Quinman. He's not here. Quinman is my best good buddy, and he is letting me borrow his 2470, which has been extremely useful when doing video and dealing with the crop factor of the EOS R. So, Quinman, if you're out there, thank you, friend. In real talk, this video is brought to you by Vintage Motorbikes. Do you like things that are loud, slow, obnoxious, and can possibly leave you stranded mile from home? Try a Vintage Motorbike. If I missed anything, let me know. I'm super happy to answer any of those unknowns or give you direction, whatever. Um, feel free to leave a comment or DM me on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. And like I said, I'm experiencing the resistance and I know how it is when you're trying something new that you haven't really done a lot of. So yeah, we're gonna go check on the motorbike. All right, come on. Penny knows. Good, the bike broke down like nine times. Penny's fault. <laughs> 